ideas. Ideas on limits. Limits on ideas. Limits to knowing. Ideas on the limits to knowing. Welcome to our fifth and final week of programs on limits to knowing. Many of the previous programs dealt, for the most part, indirectly with the philosophic aspects of the problem of limits to knowing. Tonight's program approaches the philosophic problem directly. We ask the eminent logician W. V. Quine to prepare an essay on limits for us. An essay in which he was to confront the question head on. Are there limits to knowing? You hear this essay in the first part of tonight's program. Professor W. V. Quine was recorded at Harvard University, where he is professor of philosophy. W. V. Quine is the author of many books, among them From a Logical Point of View, Word and Object, and Set Theory and Logic. Are there things that man can never know? I'm going to be concerned less with giving a straight answer to this question than with examining the question and ringing changes on it. Some variants of the question admit of obvious, uninteresting answers. Obviously, there are things that man will never know. Man will never know how many cars will have entered your city between now and midnight tonight. He will never know and never care. But he could know this number if he cared enough and had the foresight to make arrangements for keeping count of the cars. The serious question, rather, is whether there are things that man could never know, however foresighted he might be in setting out observers and cameras and tape recorders and Geiger counters and other detectors. Well, we've touched up our question a little in its auxiliary verb. We're asking if there are things that man could never know. Next, the noun needs some attention. Things. We talk of knowing things. What sort of things? Stones, trees, birds, bees? No. Things is a lame word in this connection. When we ask whether there are things that man could never know, we're really asking whether there are questions that man could never answer. It's not a question of things. It's a question of questions. It's a question of questions, so it depends partly on language. To suppose there are things we can never know is to suppose, more precisely, that there are questions that we can ask in our language, but that we could never answer. Now, our language is a very rich language, and perhaps it is capable of supplying questions that man could never answer. But before we try to settle that issue regarding our language, we will do well to gain some perspective by standing off and viewing a simpler situation, the situation of a poverty-stricken language. Imagine, then, a people who have never risen to the theoretical physics of hypothetical particles, nor to set theory, or other abstract reaches of mathematics. Their language is adequate to the empirical mechanics of observable bodies, adequate to the laws of the lever and the pendulum, and falling bodies, and the laws of motion. It's adequate also to reporting the concrete facts of human history, and adequate to what, we, what used to be called natural history, to describing the observable traits of plants and the observable behavior of animals. These people are a practical lot, not very imaginative perhaps, but as alert and observant as you please, and pretty knowledgeable in their down-to-earth sort of way. And within their language, are there any questions that man could not answer? 
In a rather uninteresting sense, someone might argue still that there are such questions. It's a legalistic point having to do with generalizations. Let's take the general statement, all men are mortal. There's a big logical difference between the question how many cars will enter your city between now and midnight and the question whether all men are mortal. We could, if we wished, arrange for a conclusive answer to the question of the cars, an answer based directly on observation. We could man all points of access. But we could never arrange for a similarly conclusive answer to the mortality question based similarly on direct observation. Even if we cared so much about the answer that we were prepared to increase our observations by resorting to experimentation, which I find a rather lugubrious expedient in this instance, still there would be a difficulty in checking all instances. We could not check on ourselves and live to report an affirmative answer to the question. Other generalizations present somewhat similar difficulties, if less sanguinary ones. We felt we could answer the question, how many cars will enter before midnight, because of the feasibility of a stakeout. But if a general question covers indefinitely many cases, including cases too remote in the future to be observed by a living man, or too remote in the past to have been observed, then clearly it is a question that we cannot and could not conclusively answer on the basis directly of observation. Now there will be plenty of questions of this sort, even in the modest language of the practical people that we are imagining. Just about any generality about the care and use of one or another sort of plant, or the behavior of one or another sort of animal, or the mechanics of rigid bodies, will be a generality whose instances can be observed only by sampling and never exhausted. Must we then conclude that even in the limited language of our hypothetical practical tribe, there are questions that men could not answer? Yes, we must so conclude if we are going to be as stiff-necked as all this about what to count as answers. But we're demanding too much. We can know something in a reasonable, reasonable sense of the word without having checked every instance by direct observation. If we've done a reasonable lot of sampling of instances, or if we have a plausible notion of an underlying mechanism that would account for the truth of the general statement in question, then we may reasonably be said to know the statement to be true. Sometime we may be surprised by a counterinstance and compelled to conclude that we had not known the statement to be true after all. We only thought we did. This, however, is a risk we must run. So, let us relax our standard of what counts as the ability to answer a question. Belief, well grounded in observation, is what should count. But then, how firmly grounded should a belief be in order to count as answering a question? How shaky an answer should we allow? No general way is known of measuring the firmness of a scientific hypothesis. And if a way were known of measuring the firmness, Still, how would we decide where to draw the line? Even in the limited language of our imagined tribe, it must be possible to ask questions about remote places and events, questions admitting only of the most tenuous answers after the ablest research. But this is uninteresting. It's not what one has in mind when he asks if there are things that man can never know. It's uninteresting because of the continuity. The questions about broad generalities or about remote places and events and the questions about current local events differ only in degree. Some respond more generously to our investigations than others. I think it would be to no purpose to try to draw a line. When one asks if there are things that man can never know, he's really wondering whether some questions are unanswerable in principle. By this he means that no answer could gain any support, whatever, from even the ablest research. The question should also be somehow basically unlike the questions that we know how to find answers for.
This further requirement is, of course, hard to formulate satisfactorily. Basic unlikeness is a vague idea. However, given some such strenuous standard of what to count as an unanswerable question, I think we can say of the imagined tribe that these people can raise no questions that man could not, in principle, have hoped to answer. Now let us take leave of the imaginary tribe and move nearer home. As we move nearer home, we move farther from observation. We move into a conceptual scheme of electrons, neutrinos, and other hypothetical particles that can never be directly observed, a conceptual scheme also of kinky four-dimensional space-time and of mathematical abstractions, sets, relations, functions, integers, ratios, irrational numbers, imaginary numbers, infinite numbers. None of these extras are observable. We already allowed our imaginary tribe a language that was adequate for reporting anything observable, and a good deal more. It was adequate also for expressing generalities about any matters that were individually observable. What, then, is all this extra apparatus of ours? Is it sheer myth-making, unwarranted by observational evidence? Paradoxically, the purpose of all this extra apparatus is simplification. We are out to systematize and integrate the testimony of our senses by devising laws that relate the observable phenomena systematically to other observable phenomena. And the most systematic network of relations for this purpose turns out to be a network that links all these phenomena up with a lot of additional, unobserved, hypothetical entities that are only assumed for the purpose of integrating the system. The consequence is a rich theoretical language, rich enough, perhaps, to formulate questions that man could, in principle, never answer. For a while, let us assume that it is, so as to go on from that thought to some further ones. Afterward, I'll come back to that question. Very well, then. Granted that we, in our language, can formulate questions that man could, in principle, never answer, what are we to say of the imagined tribe that knows no such limits? We are simply to say, it would seem, that there were always these things that man could never know, but the imagined people were unable to formulate them because their language was too weak. On the other hand, it might be objected that in putting the matter thus, we are holding too parochially to the point of view of our own language. It might be objected that the low-level language was already adequate to all possible objective data, after all, and that the extra richness of our language was added only to facilitate the systematization of all possible data. It might thus be objected that when we say there are things that man could never know, when we say there are questions man could, in principle, never answer, we are merely pointing to an effect of our own artifact. This objection gained some support from a remarkable theorem of logic due to William Craig. Consider again our rich language of scientific theory and the low-level language of the imagined tribe. We may think of the low-level language as a part of the rich language. It's a part that stays closer to observable matters. The richness of the theoretical language serves the purpose, I just now suggested, of enabling us to formulate manageably simple laws relating observations to observations. But all we care about as output of the theory, let us suppose, is its empirical output. We care about those consequences, predictions for instance, that can be expressed in the low-level language. We formulate our observations in the low-level language. We combine them with theoretical laws somewhere up in the richer language. And from the combination, we deduce consequences in the low-level language. There is takeoff, flight, and landing. Now what Craig shows is that the flight into theory is logically dispensable. He shows that if we can get anywhere by plane, so to speak, we can also get there by laboriously slogging through on the ground. He shows that if you have found a way of deducing a sentence of the low-level language from other low-level sentences, 
together with some theoretical truths, you can then also find a way of deducing that same sentence from those same other low-level sentences together with some further merely low-level truths. Craig shows explicitly how we can find such a ground root once we have the air root. If the deduction of the sentence from other low-level sentences and the theoretical truths is written out explicitly in symbolic logic, he shows how to find some low-level truths that can be used in place of the theoretical ones. Craig's reasoning is quite general. It does not depend on details of the low-level language and the theoretical language, nor on how we draw the line between them. Psychologically, granted, the flight into theory is indispensable. We would not find our way across the ground but for the aerial reconnaissance. On the ground, we cannot see the woods for the trees. Theory brings system. System is simplicity, and simplicity is psychologically imperative. Very well, our objector pursues. Theory is our heuristic crutch. If I may descend from your soaring metaphor of flight to my limping metaphor of the crutch. So our rich language differs from the low-level language of the imagined tribe in having this heuristic crutch, this handy artifact. The objector concludes by repeating himself, saying once more that those purported questions that man could in principle never answer are merely an effect of his own artifact. Even our objector is bound to recognize that this heuristic aid has worked wonders. It has had man soaring, not limping. Man's power over nature is awesome, staggering. It's due to scientific theory, and it would have been humanly, psychologically impossible within the narrower language of the imagined tribe, but this is by the way. I have given our objector his fair share of program time. He would like us to believe, I suppose, that the atom and elementary particles and the sets and numbers and functions are unreal, mere heuristic fictions. Is he right? If we are looking for questions that man could in principle never answer, perhaps we have a shining candidate right here. Are the hypothetical particles of physics and the abstract objects of mathematics real or mere heuristic fictions? It would seem indeed that man can never know. Everything observable, everything that could be available as evidence, is expressible in the low-level language which shuns these controversial entities. Moreover, in view of Craig's theorem, all the inferential connections can, in principle, be held to that low level, too. It's only to make the inferences easier that we venture higher. We might say of hypothetical particles and mathematical objects what Voltaire said of God, that if they hadn't existed, they would have had to be invented. Who is to say, then, whether they exist or were invented? Have we here reached the limits of knowledge, the unanswerable question? I think not. If we subscribe to our physical theory and our mathematics, as indeed we do, then we thereby accept these particles and these mathematical objects as real. It would be an empty gesture, meanwhile, to cross our fingers as if to indicate that what we are saying doesn't count. And if rather than subscribing to our physical theory and mathematics, we were to adhere to the low-level language, then the question of the reality of the particles and the mathematical objects would simply not be there. It could not be phrased. We have to work within some conceptual scheme or other. We can switch schemes, but we cannot stand apart from all of them. It's meaningless, while working within a theory, to question the reality of its objects or the truth of its laws, unless in so doing we're thinking of abandoning the theory and adopting another. Let us then resume our accustomed stance at last within the evolving conceptual scheme that we take seriously. We are swarms of particles, swarms of medium density, making our filtered way through thinner swarms, and moving erratically between other swarms as dense as or denser than ourselves. 
This, by our present lights, is how things are. We may learn better, but meanwhile we do what we can. Cozily ensconced, then, in these familiar old digs, let us consider again our original question about questions. Are there, from this point of view, things that man could never know? Are there questions man could, in principle, never answer? Possible cases in mathematics come to mind. There is something called the continuum hypothesis, having to do with the comparative sizes of certain infinite classes. Court Gödel and Paul J. Cohen have proved that this hypothesis can be neither proved nor disproved on the basis of the existing codifications of accepted mathematical laws. Still, this is not a clearly unanswerable question. For remember the role of theoretical entities, mathematical and otherwise. They are extras that serve to fill in and smooth out and simplify the comprehensive world system by which, ultimately, we link phenomena to one another. Now there may, in time, emerge new simplicity considerations, new plausibility considerations, that can reasonably supplement our existing codifications of accepted mathematical laws. These added laws just might suffice in the end for proving or disproving the continuum hypothesis. A different sort of mathematical case that comes to mind is the celebrated theorem due also to Gödel, to the effect that there can never be a complete formal proof procedure for what is called elementary number theory. This modest-seeming branch of mathematics treats of nothing more recondite than the positive integers. Yet Gödel has proved that any axiom system is bound to be inadequate to it. It is bound to leave some truths of elementary number theory unprovable. Any axiom system for it will be incomplete, and so will any other method of explicit proof. I'm having to leave my statement a bit vague, for otherwise the story is long. Now this is a remarkable and startling result. I haven't time to explain how startling or why, but does it point to unanswerable questions? It does not. No truths of elementary number theory are set apart by Gödel's theorem as unprovable. Rather, each axiom system or proof procedure will miss some of those truths, other proof procedures can cover those or some of them and miss others. As I already suggested in connection with the continuum hypothesis, plausibility considerations can augment existing codifications of accepted mathematical laws. Gödel's theorem shows that such augmentation can never yield any one finished system in which every truth of elementary number theory admits of proof but it does not show that any one truth of elementary number theory is forever inaccessible. Turning now to natural science, one thinks of Werner Heisenberg's principle of indeterminacy. There's a strict limit to the accuracy with which man can know the position and velocity of an elementary particle. The accuracy of position can be increased beyond a certain point only by sacrificing accuracy of velocity. Physicists tell us that this is a hard and fast limitation, a limitation in principle, not to be surmounted by any manner of observation and experiment. Man could, in principle, not answer the question of the position and velocity of the particle, except up to the prescribed band of tolerance. Here, then, is a really good example of the limits of knowledge. New discoveries might, of course, lead to revisions of physical theory and upset Heisenberg's indeterminacy principle. But even short of such an event, opinion is divided regarding the interpretation of the principle. Some hold that the particle has indeed its exact position and velocity, and that these are in principle inscrutable. Those physicists then acknowledge that we have here a straightforward example of the limits of knowledge. Other physicists hold that the particle simply has no exact position and velocity. This claim raises obvious logical difficulties, and some physicists have gone so far as to revise logical theory to accommodate them. One would hope for a less drastic remedy, but at any rate the motive is clear. 
there's a reluctance to assign meaning to strictly unanswerable questions. Questions, let us remember, are in language. Language is learned by people, from people, only in relation, ultimately, to observable circumstances of utterance. The relation of language to observation is often very devious, but observation is finally all there is for language to be anchored to. If a question could, in principle, never be answered, then one feels that language has gone wrong. Language has parted its moorings, and the question has no meaning. On this philosophy, of course, our central question has a sweeping answer. The question was whether there are things man could never know. The question was whether there are questions, meaningful questions, that man could, in principle, never answer. On this philosophy, the answer to this question of questions is no. W. V. Quine, logician of Harvard University, with his answer to the question, are there limits? In the second part of tonight's program, anthropologist Magora Maroyama discusses different kinds of logical systems and how movements, such as the ecological movement, seem to require logics totally different from our society's present one. Logics that resemble those of the Hopi and Navajo Indians. Dr. Maroyama talked with producer Paul Buckley in Washington at the meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Recently, there are there have been social movements in the United States and in other countries, and maybe also in on international scenes. And uh, those movements originated from quite different sources. Like in the United States, there there are the ethnic movements, there is a hippie movement, and there is a ecology movement, and they originated quite from quite different sources. The uh, ethnic movements originated from the oppressed poor people. The hippie movement originated from the rich kids. The ecology movement has a great deal of support among middle class and even among conservatives. Okay? And uh, they didn't come to that, those movements for the same reason, and they don't understand one another very well. But the interesting part of that is they are converging into a, a new kind of logic. That is to say that if the traditional logic could be characterized by being unidirectional, hierarchical, uh, competitive, uh, quantitative, and so on and so forth. How can you call a logic competitive? Uh, competitive, the, the, um, by that I mean the, in the, particularly in the United States. There is a uh, the, the paradigm. I mean, that may be an attitude, but I, yeah. I fully okay. see it as, oh, a, okay, as okay. a logical, uh, okay, as an element see. of a logic. Yeah, uh, well, this is uh, more or less the idea that the universe can be rank ordered, or the things in the universe can be rank ordered, and if there are two things, one must be higher than the other, mm -hmm. or equal, and so on and so forth. Okay. And, and okay. uniformistic. Right. Okay, so hierarchy to, co to competitiveness. Yeah, well, okay. because of the hierarchy, yeah. and because of yeah. uh, rankableness. Mm -hmm. And the hierarchical way of looking at the universe, so it becomes a kind of competitive difference. Yeah. And uh, homogenistic. Now, the new movements are converging into just almost the opposite kind of logic, which is non hierarchical, interactionistic, heterogeneistic, uh, mutualistic, relational, qualitative, contextual, and so on and so forth. Can we talk about each one of those things in, yeah. in a bit of detail? Yeah, okay. Um, actually, it's not a new invention. Some people say this is a new kind of logic, but that type of logic existed 
in many cultures, particularly some of the American Indian tribes, Navajos, Eskimos, and so forth, and, and some of the African countries. So it's not a, really uh, a new logic. And the Chinese logic is something else. It's not exactly mutualistic, but it's a complementary. Maybe I can give you an example of how it is difficult for some people to switch over to the new kind of logic. Mm -hmm. The ask the question which came first is very Western, because mm -hmm. in the mutualistic logic, you don't ask that question. Things can be simultaneous and mutually reinforcing and causing one another. Okay, the, uh, uh, recently I was in Bucharest in the uh, in, uh, that's, uh, what is the future research the International Future Research Conference. Okay, and so uh, there is almost like a zeitgeist there. Uh, many people came up with similar ideas that we should have more grassroots people participating. We shouldn't have this hierarchical government or the hierarchical way of controlling information. There should be more mutualistic, uh, no hierarchical way of distributing information and so forth. And so Robert Jung called it a zeitgeist. And we talked a great deal about this. And many people brought up the similar idea from different sources. And then there was one person who stood up and said uh, something like, well, look, uh, heterogeneity is fine, grass is fine, but if we don't have uniformity, if we don't have a hierarchy, we are going to have a chaos, right? And the person said that. And I think this is, uh, again, another hang-up of the Western logic. That is, uh, if you don't have a hierarchy, you're going to have atomistic chaos. And this is just within one logical paradigm. And it uh, is not taking into consideration another logical paradigm, which is a heterogeneistic, mutualistic paradigm, which is coming up all over the places in the world. Okay. Yeah. Um, what about mutualistic, then? Mutualistic? Yeah, what do you mean by that? Okay, um, maybe I can give you some example. Uh, for example, Navajo society, th that's an American Indian tribe. And then uh, let me c uh, caution that Navajo is not really a typically American, or typical American Indian tribe, because a lot of other tribes are different, and they resent Navajo being taken as an example all the time, <laughs> okay? Uh, but anyway, the Navajo society is mutualistic in the sense that uh, nobody gets rich. Uh, there is no idea of chief. There is uh, uh, nobody who directs somebody else. Uh, and uh, the social interaction takes place uh, quite uh, uh, mutualistically. And uh, a particular good example for that is a ceremony called Sing. Okay. Sing uh, is called for when somebody gets sick. The family calls for uh, 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 calls a medicine man, you're going to have a sing. And in this particular ceremony, what happens is many people come from all over the places. And uh, uh, people who have a lot of food will bring a lot of food. People who have no food will bring almost no food, but everybody can eat, you see. And uh, so that's uh, one way of economic distribution. You don't have to have insurance, you don't have to have social welfare, you don't have to have income taxes, and, uh, and no is the government, and it's taken care of that way. And another interesting point about this uh, uh, thing is that it's a religious activity, because, you know, it's a religious thing, as far as Navajo is concerned. And also, it's an uh, economic distribution. And also, people are going to have social contacts. Uh, they are going to be uh, dances and uh, this or that, a lot of things going on. And also, in order to perform it, you'd have to have a, a highly artistic skills. Uh, like singing is a highly artistic thing. Well, there's a lot of singing. So people sing in those singing ceremonies. And also so-called sand painting, which is not really sand, but uh, anyway, the painting you do on the, on the sand is highly artistic. And uh, so the whole idea of Navajo life is to enjoy harmony and beauty. Okay? And uh, now religion is not something hierarchical either. 
uh, nobody is higher. The gods are not higher than people. Uh, in fact, there are uh, no such thing as a, uh, Almighty God in our course. There are spirits and ghosts and so forth, natural mm -hmm. uh, forces and animals, and they are mutually interactive in such a way that people can influence the spirits and the spirits can in influence people. So influences go both ways. Same thing with animals. Okay. And uh, so in that culture, you have a, a good example of a mutualistic logic, a mutualistic perception, mutualistic social interactions. And uh, on top of that, you have a non-classificational logic. Non-classificational? Yeah, a uh, good example of it. Uh, in other words, in the Western society, things have got to be classified. People are going to ask you, what are you? Are you a sociologist? Are you an anthropologist? Are you a newspaper man? You have to be classified. The activity of a thing cannot be classified as an economic activity or a religious activity or a technological activity because everything is interwoven in the Navajo culture. Now, the religion, the curing ceremonies in Navajo is essentially something you do to uh, restore the disturbed harmony in the community and in the universe. How does it get disturbed? Uh, somebody maybe violating something like uh, uh, you're not supposed to do certain things with certain animals and you know somebody does something wrong and then the harmony is disturbed okay and uh, so the uh, actually the religious ceremonies uh, the, uh, the medicine must cure consisting finding out what went wrong and uh, then in order to cure the patient he has to perform very a detailed, described, uh, complicated ceremony, you know, uh, prescribed or very complicated. And in order to do that, uh, and, and for the purpose of doing that is to restore the harmony. So the uh, Navajo ceremony is, is characterized by more or less an atmosphere of an engineer trying to uh, fix a machine that has been broken, you know, complicated machine that was broken. You have to follow certain ways to trace it and then certain careful ways to put it back together. And so the, that's the kind of atmosphere you get in the Navajo ceremony. So, so you don't have this uh, uh, dominance of God over people, that type of feeling that you find in the Christian church, you see. And uh, so the religion is technology, and, and the religion is science, and the religion is aesthetics, and uh, everything is yeah. very much... No, this is not necessarily, you're not going to generalize that. Um, I don't know what we'll call it, because I hate to call it ne negatively by the word non-Western, because it should have a positive name as well. What, what shall we call it? A holistic oh. logic? Uh, uh, no, it's, uh, I, I would like to call it uh, homogeneous, uh, not, not, I, I'm sorry, the uh, mutualistic logic. Uh, not necessarily heterogeneistic, even though there are some heterogeneistic elements in the Navajo cultures. Yes. You yourself were um, born and, and part of your education occurred in Japan. That's correct, yes. Now, how does that particular logic differ from, from the West and the Navajos? Because it seems to me that you do oh. have a hierarchical situa a situation in That's Japan. That's quite correct, yes. Jap Japan has a hierarchical situation, and uh, that is a sort of a vertical mutualism. Now, and that might sound a little bit contradictory, uh, but what it is is a, a company president feels obligated to the subordinates, and subordinates feel obligated to the company president. And uh, a, a good example of that is um, uh, I have a brother who works for a company, and uh, now his company is not doing a very good well in terms of business, but he doesn't want to quit because he feels that if he quits, he's going to demoralize the people who are working under him. So he's just sticking to it, you see. And uh, uh, also the president of that company feels obligated to him because he promised certain things to my brother, which he couldn't fulfill because the company didn't do well. And uh, so he feels terribly obligated to my brother. And so this is a, a vertical mutualism, but uh, then it's not uh, really trying to evade, I'm not trying to evade the, uh, uh, the fact that there is a hierarchy in Japan. Uh, Japan is a very hierarchical culture in a way, but even though within the hierarchical culture there's a no hierarchical or mutualistic element, mm -hmm. 
Yes, Japan was a very hierarchical society, and both vertically and horizontally. And vertically, I mean, you know, you used to have distinct social classes, and you couldn't intermarry between the social classes and all this sort of thing, and other titles and uh, uh, who is superior and who is in inferior is a very important thing in Japan. In fact, when Japanese people get together, the first thing they have they have to do is to establish the rank order, so to speak, to find out who is superior and who is inferior. And unless you have found out uh, who is superior and who is inferior, you are very uncomfortable because you don't know how to behave, you see. So uh, in that sense, Japanese culture is very hierarchical. Now, Westerners or the Americans are now talking about future shock, uncertainties, okay? Uh, whereas from my own point of view, that is, if I'm seeing things the, the way that's natural to me, I don't talk about future shock or uncertainty. Uh, because, you see, basically in Japan, you are brought up with the idea that everything changes, okay? And so if something changes, that's no shock. Uh, whereas in the Western culture, there's the idea of substance which persists, the individual which persists, uh, things that persist. And uh, if something disappears or changes, then that's going to be something unusual to talk about. Whereas if your assumption is that everything changes, then you don't have to talk about change as something special. The same thing about uncertainty. You know, the whole notion of uncertainty in the Western culture or in the American culture is based on the assumption of certainty. Then you have to talk about uncertainty, you see. Mm. Then another interesting aspect of the Japanese culture is that uh, if you really look at the Japanese garden design uh, or the flower arrangements, you find that it's quite different from the Roman way of building cities, say, or the French way of building a garden, or Italian way of building a garden. And the designers used to say, well, you know, Italian or French way of building a garden is geometric, symmetrical, and so forth. And the Japanese way is asymmetrical. But it doesn't really explain too much. Now, uh, uh, last year, I was looking at some of the designs, and I got the idea that maybe one another possible way to see the difference is that the Japanese design, that is the Japanese garden, or the flower arrangements, um, is based on the uh, idea of heterogeneity, how to combine heterogeneity. Whereas the Italian garden design or French garden design is based on the unity on the basis of repetition of the same themes or same this or that. If sizes are different, shapes must be the same, and so on and so forth. Okay, so you, you get some unity out of the sameness. Whereas the Japanese garden design gets a kind of unity out of heterogeneity by combining different elements. And now I looked at the Tanges Olympic building complex design in Tokyo, and that particular design struck me as a like a flower arrangement almost. Uh, some people call it asymmetrical, but I saw in it uh, a heterogeneistic principle. But recently I talked to with one of Tanges students, and I asked, the world, does Tanges see his principles as a heterogeneous or heterogeneistic? And he says, no, Tange is much more homogenistic. So I'm a little bit confused about it. But anyway, the, it seems to me that that might be one way to look at the difference between the Japanese design principle and the Western design principle. But uh, I'm a little confused now because we started off talking about logics. That's correct, yeah. But uh, when you talked about the Navajo uh, culture and the Japanese culture, you, talk, uh, you really imply quite a bit more than logic. Yeah. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? Actually, I mean yeah. 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 Well, uh, maybe I'm taking logic in a much wider sense. I sometimes call epistemologies. Mm -hmm. uh, but epistemology, as far as I remember, means the science of knowledge. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes so you, uh, just yeah. you can call, call it patterns of thinking. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, sometimes you call paradigms. You know, depends depending on whom you're talking with. If you're talking with physicists, you talk about paradigms, or you call those differences as uh, paradigmatic differences. Yeah. And if you are talking with anthropologists, you talk about the epistemological differences. If you're talking about philosophers, you say something like logical differences. Well, let me ask that question. Are there logical differences? Well, yeah. Apart uh, from cultural ones. Well, you mm. see, the, uh, you can show mathematically that if you want to solve something like a feedback loop, the very straight linear feedback system, uh, if you want to solve it with a simultaneous equation, you can solve it. But if you try to reason that here is an input which is amplified and becomes an output, then you take such a percentage of output and subtract from the input. You, if you do stepwise, you, you cannot solve it. You, know, you come to a very silly contradiction. You're subtracting something bigger than the original or some kind of crazy thing. You can't solve it. Mm -hmm. So uh, by trying to break down the mutual simultaneous relationship into the uh, consecutive unidirectional relationships, you're just uh, not getting the right mathematics there. So you're making some errors, which should be a logical error. So in that sense, uh, logically then, in that sense, there are no parts, really. Well, or, or if there are okay. parts, they can't be isolated from well, the Well, when you talked about holistic, mm -hmm. that itself is also based on the Greek logic, you see? Whole parts, a dichotomy is based on the Greek logic. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you talk about the relatedness, that's something else. Because holistic might sound as if you have different parts which you can just put together. You, know. you mentioned something about the Chinese culture being different again yeah. from both the Japanese and the Navajo. Okay. In, in, in the larger use of, of logic that, that you mentioned. Oh, yeah, Chinese logic, uh, some people say that's a dualistic logic, uh, which sounds more like a Hegelian kind of dialectic. So the comparison has been made. In fact. Yeah, in fact, many people make that comparison, but I think that's wrong because the Hegelian uh, dialectic is, or uh, that is the way the Marx put it, it's more as, uh, like a, a contrast or a conflict between two, you know, uh, two social classes. Where the Chinese way of looking at it is uh, two are uh, understandable only in terms of the other. That like uh, if you have a front of the car. You've got to have a back of the car. You can't have just front of the car with no back of the car, you see. And so uh, the way I can characterize the Chinese logic is not dualistic in the sense of conflicts between the two things, but rather the, uh, uh, again, like my perspectives, two perspectives to the same situation. Um, recently, last month, in fact, in Toronto, we had the American Anthropological Association meeting and the, in that meeting, there was a very interesting paper uh, presented by an American anthropologist about the Chinese way of looking at pollution. And uh, basically, the paper says something like this. The Western, and some, to some extent, the Canadian way of looking at so-called waste is characterized by the Greek logic. That is, if something changes into something else, uh, like uh, a glass, uh, glass breaks down, something like this, then you cannot use it because it's something different. So then, since this is something different, you got to do one of the two things, either throw them away, put them out of the site, or restore them into the original shape so that you can use it. Okay. So there is either waste or recycling. You Since something changes, it has to be either thrown out or restored. So, whereas the Chinese way of looking at it is that everything changes, okay? And there's nothing that subsists like a substance in the Western logic. And therefore, when something changes, that's quite natural. Uh, it's not a waste. You know, it's not called waste. There's no such thing as waste. No. In a sense. Uh, all, you, all you have to do is to find another different use for it. Okay? Yeah. You don't have to recycle it. You don't have to throw it away. You just have to find a new use for it. Which is a quite, quite a different strategy from the American way of dealing with the pollution.
Okay, I gave you uh, some example of a, a c uh, on the front side of the car and back side of the car. Yeah, right. But this is it according to the Chinese way we're looking at it, selling and buying is the same activity. Whereas uh, American people say that's the opposite activity. Okay, because selling buy buying is the same activity seen from two different sides. You see. And then if you you ask a Chinese person what is a wife. And that person would say, that's somebody who has got a husband. So you, ask, you say, who is what husband? They say, well, that's somebody who's got a wife. And it just doesn't work in the Western logic, but it's perfectly acceptable in China, you see. Is it possible to have a view of, of all of these different logics that doesn't have any of the characteristics of any one of those? What kind of language do we need, or, or does it already exist, to deal with this thing, to, to, to get it out of that inherent bias? Do I have to learn Japanese? Do I have to be a Japanese person to, to know this? Well, I think it's some certain things cannot be communicated. Okay? I think it's a wrong assumption to say everything can be communicated, everything can be explained uh, in from one thought pattern to another. S uh, but I think uh, it's also a mistake to say nothing can be communicated. So uh, uh, there must be some improved way, improved mm -hmm. way of communicating. Mm -hmm. okay. And I think we need a new science, the science of different logics or different thought patterns. And I don't mean necessarily the difference between East and West and so forth, but rather the difference which also exists between different professions, say, in the same culture. Like um, psychiatrists don't think like economists. And it's not because their subject matters are different, but their paradigms are different. And even in physics, you find uh, experimental physicists or applied physicists thinking quite differently from uh, theoretical physicists. And e even in mathematics, you find uh, paradigm differences also. Uh, or maybe sometimes it might be much finer differences in the kind of preferences of a certain patterns of thinking. Like uh, people who deal with the function of complex variables uh, think in a different sort of a way as compared to the people who deal with differential equations, say, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, so we need some science to study those different paradigms or different patterns and I think it's going to be very very useful. Right now I'm involved in the uh, practical work working with government uh, which has to do some engineering projects which has to take into consideration sociological and, and cultural aspects of the project and so on and so forth. So I have a very difficult situation of uh, making engineers see another paradigm or making engineers thinking other paradigms than engineering paradigm and uh, making uh, some, uh, say, the students see the government paradigm, for example. And uh, now, unless we know that we are using different paradigms, people are going to either uh, disagree and uh, call one another illogical or more or less uh, come up with an illusion of understanding where there is no understanding and all sorts of things can happen but if we have some science of different paradigms then we can at least say well those are different paradigms you see, before you go into disagreement or illusion of agreement well, this comes back to the question I asked though. is the yeah. engineer going to have to study I mean how do you get that paradigm I mean, can, you, can you communicate the paradigm without its context like, okay. you know, supposing you want, because I witnessed here today several confrontation yeah. between young scientists, science for the people, yeah. and other scientists. And it's yeah. clear they, they, they were not, I mean, the communication was just not there. And, it's, and it may be because, as you suggest, that their paradigms or their patterns of perception are totally different. Yeah. How do you translate that without transferring the context? Okay, well now, certain things are easy to explain. You know, certain paradigms are easy to explain. And I think we can start with the paradigms that are easy to explain. Like with engineers, 
I'm going to write within a few weeks a paper which was suggested by the people in our organization that I should write a paper uh, showing two or three different paradigms for engineers. Uh, one is a mutualistic paradigm, the other one is a unidirectional causal paradigm, the other one is a random process paradigm. Those are the things that are easy to understand from engineering point of view. Uh, uh, other paradigms are rather difficult, but at least with those things, examples, I can show that there are different paradigms, and I think that's already one step forward. Uh, there is no science of, uh, uh, no, no established or no well-organized science of how to communicate different paradigms or cross-paradigmatic communication. It would seem to, to be becoming very urgent. Yes, I think so. It's very important. Aside from this difficulty in communicating between paradigms, there are other problems in communication that is particularly, uh, there are several factors really. That I discovered this when I was doing a, a project in the prison and also when I was in Denmark. You see, the, uh, uh, when I was in oh. Denmark, I found out that the purpose of communication is not exchange of information, really, uh, which Americans assume the communication is supposed to be. Okay. Um, in Denmark, for example, the uh, purpose of the most usual communication uh, that happens daily is the perpetuation of the familiar. Uh, people get together in the same cafe, drinking the same coffee, eating the same pastry uh, yeah. once a week. It's uh, like saying it's a nice day, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and actually, the, what you do is to perpetuate the familiar. Okay? And if somebody asks a new question or brings new information, that's more or less disturbing. And uh, so the foreigners make a mistake in, in Denmark in uh, trying to establish friendship by asking questions or explaining something. And, then, uh, and according to Danish paradigms, that's being too aggressive or impolite or something. And then they will, that kind of procedure will turn off the Danes very fast. And even among the Danes, newcomers are welcome when they move from one group to another. But a newcomer must stay with the group long enough to absorb what is going on there. Nobody is going to explain to you what, what's going on. It's impolite to explain. And uh, you're not going to ask questions either because it's impolite. So a newcomer might stay sort of green for three months or six months in Denmark, even if it's a day. You see, the, when a day moves from one group to another, you know, you've got to stay green for a long time. Magora Maroyama on Mutualistic Logics. The program was produced in Toronto by Paul Buckley. Technical Operation, John Hollinger.